I want to welcome you to the third session of the day and uh, uh, on our review here. And in this session, we're going to talk about what I call pre-rapture events. That's probably a misnomer because different people, good scholars have different views, but these are events that I personally suspect will uh, 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 occur, could, could occur before the rapture because they're not determinate in terms of violating eminency. And yet I suspect they occur prior to the 70th week of Daniel. And so uh, it may be the, the best nomenclature we use there. And then we will, of course, explore the main thrust of the session will be the 70th week. We've talked about all the rest of it, but we'll get into that, how it's defined, and this peculiar event called the abomination of desolation, what that's all about. And then, of course, the Antichrist. And realize the Antichrist is not one guy. It's a couple, a duet between the first beast of Revelation 13 and the second beast of Revelation 13. And we'll talk about the mark of the beast. There's so much misinformation floating around that, and there may be a surprise hidden behind it all. So we'll take a look at that in this session. So the Magog invasion. And uh, most of you that have studied Ezekiel 38 and 39 are familiar with this. And uh, you wonder, why the strange names, Magog and all of that? And that's, of course, our fault, because we keep changing the names of things, you see. There was a place called Petrograd for many years, and they changed the name to St. Petersburg. And then it became Leningrad, and now it is uh, St. Petersburg again. My friends in Russia remind me that in Russia, even the past is uncertain. So they redefine things. Uh, Byzantium was the capital of the world for a while, and then they called it Constantinople. The, the Muslims took it over, and now it's Istanbul. But it's, we keep changing the names of things. And uh, Cape Canaveral, remember Cape Canaveral? That came close to being called, uh, uh, you know, it's called Cape Kennedy and came awfully close to being Cape Hillary if we weren't careful, but anyway. Um, so the Magog invasion. It's well known among Bible. Many Christians are surprised there are other chapters in Ezekiel too. Everybody studied 38 and 39. But be that as it may, it, it's well known among Bible scholars for two reasons. The first is it's the occasion which God himself intervenes to quell an ill-fated attempt to invade Israel by a group of people called Magog and their allies. And uh, the allies are listed there in the past. Persia, Cush, Put, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Meshach, and Tubal, and so forth. And uh, the second reason it's so well known by so many is it appears to allude to the use of nuclear weapons. And we'll take a quick look at some of that. But to cut, to cut through a lot of the identities, what happens, there's a group called Magog, one of the sons of Japheth and his descendants, and they, um, uh, a group of peoples by their ancient names are, and you have a map in there that attempts to highlight some of those, but they align themselves in, a t in an attempt to invade Israel. And that uh, attempt is thwarted by hailstones of fire and all kinds of exciting things. Sheba and Dedan are on the sidelines saying, what are you guys doing? They're not participants nor defenders. They're on the sidelines. Strange situation here. And so Ezekiel 38 implies that the, uh, Israel is at peace and without walls. Well, if you're really strict in your scripture, you've got a problem with that because they're not really at peace. And they certainly have walls. Um, we know there are major walls in history. There are, of course, the Chinese wall, which was, writ was built to keep Magog out of China, by the way, if you get into the background. Uh, the Berlin Wall we're all familiar with in our recent history. Well, in Israel today, there's a 430-mile wall 25 feet high. You can't escape that as a part of the news. So how can you call it in a land of unwalled villages? It doesn't quite, it, it gives a, someone that's strict a little discomfort, if you will. There certainly are preparatory steps going on. The Arab-Israeli conflict, of course, is overlaying all this sort of thing. Uh, clearly, Iran is emerging as a nuclear power here shortly, and that's becoming a day-by-day a, a -day source of intelligence information. There were oil discoveries in the Caspian Sea between Russia and Iran, but perhaps even more than that, there are huge trillions of dollars of discoveries uh, just off the shore of Israel today. So it's, it's starting to look uh, as an attractive target. But all these are preparatory steps, perhaps, in advance of what may be ultimately the big show. But there's a question that we need to put right in front of us as we get enthusiastic about Ezekiel 38 and 39. 
There are good scholars, and I'll use Hal Lindsey as, a, as an exemplar here, that argue that the Ezekiel 38 and 39 is part of the Armageddon scenario, as is summarized in Daniel 11. That's their view, and that's fine. There's a group of us that suspect that Ezekiel 38 may be preceding to the 70th week of Daniel, which is one reason I'm throwing it in here right now. The problem is the missing nations. The Magog invasion deals with peoples that are distant from Israel, a large outer circle of nations. And so, okay, what about the immediate neighbors? And uh, so, where are the Palestinians? Where are the Lebanese? Where are the Syrians? Where is Iraq? And where, is the, where are the Jordanians to the east of Israel? Where are the Egyptians? They're noticeably absent in the Magog invasion. And so, and where are the Saudi Arabians? In Ezekiel 38, they're on the sidelines. Why, why, why aren't they in the picture somehow? Well, as we look at this, we have the nations that are surrounding Israel immediately the subject of another passage. And, uh, and we have the, uh, the uh, uh, displaced Arab refugees, I can call them that, uh, which we call the Palestinians. And so, there's another subtlety I'll put in our thoughts in Ezekiel 37. You may, prior to Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's the famous dry bones vision, where, the, where, where the Israel uh, is regathered as a people. And it says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, in that passage, the word exceedingly is an adverb, not an adjective. It's an exceedingly great army, which implies it becomes ultimately. It isn't yet. They have a great defensive army, but they're not a conquest kind of army. And yet this implies something else that may be part of the coloration here. There are three steps in Ezekiel 37. They're, they were scattered, then they came together with flesh and skin and the idiom of the vision there, and uh, then they came to life and so forth. So the exceedingly great army is an interesting phrase there. The, the, and of course the proud, um, uh, the elite of the services in Israel are the tank corps, by the way. But anyway, let's get, take a look at a psalm that is widely overlooked among students of prophecy. It's coming more in the fore in, in the recent last couple of years, and that's Psalm 83. So I want to pause and take a look at this a little more closely. And I suspect that this is a scenario that's more immediate on our horizon and may be an essential prelude to Ezekiel 38 and 39. So let's take a look at it. And so it's, a, it's, one of the, it's the last of the Asaph Psalms. And the psalmist says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. So it's a call to God for action, if you will. And the psalmist says, For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. Wow. And so this is the last of the Asaph Psalms, and it's a puzzling one. It has a number of phrases in it that raise some issues. Whoever these enemies are, the psalmist is calling God's attention to, is they've lifted up their head. What does that mean? Well, let's go on here. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Now the lingering mystery behind this psalm that haunts me still is who are these hidden ones? The psalmist is calling God's attention to the fact that the people of Israel are in jeopardy, and we'll get to that. But he also alludes this and consulted against thy hidden ones. Who are, at this point, God's hidden ones? Wouldn't be the angels for a lot of reasons. Who would it be? One of my conjectures, the word hidden ones by me, it means the Hebrew word means the hidden treasured ones. They're, they're, they're a prize, if you will, sort of. And uh, who are the hidden ones? My candidate possibility, maybe there, this is after the rapture, and these are the raptured saints that are absent from the earth at that time. If that's true, it has huge implications for us. But let's just table that for the moment and go on and see what the psalmist says here. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. In other words, the enemies of God have aligned themselves. Is it come, let us cut them off, that is Israel, from being a nation. 
that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That's the plea of the enemies of God that's going on. The psalmist is calling God's attention to this. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, God. Get the picture here. The enemies of Israel have aligned themselves with one objective. To wipe Israel off the map. Not to take spoil. See, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, they, take, they go to take the, the assembly against uh, Israel in Ezekiel 38 is take spoil. Cattle and goods, gold and silver. They're going for spoil. Not here. They're going to wipe them out. You see the difference? Fundamental. The very commitment of Islam is to wipe Israel off the face of the map. That's exactly what the psalmist is calling God's attention to. Are you going to let that happen? Is in effect what he's saying to God. And he goes on here. See, the primary basis of the confederation of these enemies of Israel is to wipe them off the map. Okay. And we know about some people who articulate this rather vehemently in recent years, of course, Ahmadinejad. And, uh, and here are the people that are involved. He lists them in the psalm. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, Gabal and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. And Asher also is joined with them, and they have holpen the children of Lot. Well, the tabernacles of Edom, who are they? Now, there's a whole other study that I really commend you to get into, and that's the, who are the Edomites today? And you'll be in for some huge surprises. And I don't want to use up our time chasing that one. I'm just going to aver for our purposes today that Edom uh, is, of course, among the traditional enemies of Israel, and they are singled out by, uh, by the the Old Testament for special judgment and so forth. We'll talk more about them as we go, probably. The tents of Edom, I'm going to suggest, are the Palestinian refugees and the southern Jordanians. And let's just leave that without proof at the moment because it gets into some side studies that we'll use up our time on. And, uh, but the tents of Edom, I'll show you pictures of the tents of Edom today. And these are traditional ones. And perhaps the most astonishing one is one of 96,000 people in southern Lebanon the Palestinian refugee camps. And uh, th they're not limited to Edomites, but the Edomites are among them. And the Edomites are a special mentioned by Jesus in two of the letters of the seven churches. In Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9, those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan, are objects of Christ's comments. And we'll talk about that as a separate issue. But let's go on here. Of all these guys, the Ishmaelites, of course, are pretty straightforward. Many people don't realize that the sons of Edom were also Ishmaelites because uh, Genesis tells us he'll be a wide man, his hand shall be against every man, every man's hand against him. The Ishmaelites are impossible having peace even among themselves. If we look at the sons of Abraham, under Sarah, of course, it's Isaac. Under Hagar, it was Ishmael. And under some others, it was Keturah. Now, what's interesting, of course, is Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And they started fighting each other when they were still in the womb. And Esau, of course, gets outsmarted by Jacob, lo loses his birthright. And so he's really teed off for that whole chicanery. And he deliberately marries into uh, a, um, a wife of, uh, of uh, Nebajoth, uh, which is an Ishmaelite. And Genesis 20, he deliberately marries an Ishmaelite to, to upset his parents. And that means then his descendants are Ishmaelites. They are what the press typically calls Arabs. Many of them have nothing to do with Arabia particularly, but that's just the label the press uses out of their illiteracy. But the sons of Esau and the sons of Ishmael are indistinguishable because they didn't keep separate records for what it's worth. And uh, so there are no tribal distinctions were maintained. We have then also the um, Moabites. Anyway, uh, so Moab, of course, is a descendant of Lot. And the Palestinian refugees in central Jordan would be included by that label. And so we have the Hagarines. Sons of Hagar were Egyptians. That's a way of referring to Egypt, the sons of Hagar, if you will. And so uh, they were Egyptians. And so, and then we have Gabal, which is uh, uh, no the northern Lebanese. And then we have Ammon, which is the Palestinian refugees and the northern J Jordanians. The capital of Jordan is Amman after Ammon, if you will. And so then we have uh, Amalek, if you will, uh, the Arab south of Israel, if you will. 
Uh, Agag was the king of the Amalekites, and you remember Haman of Esther was an Amalekite. And so we're familiar with those groups. And then we have the Philistines, and uh, the, obviously the Hamas and the Gaza, the Gaza Strip is in that region. And uh, then we have the inhabitants of Tyre, which are the Hezbollah and the southern Lebanese. And we also have uh, Asher, which is uh, joined with them, and that's of course Assyria. And uh, then we have uh, uh, Syria and northern Iraq. And then we have uh, ho- the word hope, and in the King James, is a, it really means being an arm to. That's a word out of not our normal English today, so I, I threw that in here for to, to edify, if you will, the King James. And so, um, and then we have the children of Lot, which of course is Moab and Ammon. So w- these are the circular, these are the immediate neighbors of Israel here. And uh, so then the, the, the psalmist says, do unto them, and then he draws a bunch of examples from the book of Judges, 4 and 5 and what have you. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Syria, and as to Jabin, the brook of Kison, and, uh, which perished at Endor, and they became as dung for the earth. And so, uh, um, so why wouldn't God judge them in the future as he did in the past? Sort of the implied question by the psalmist here. And uh, so, and so uh, God hasn't changed. And so the psalmist is saying, do unto these guys what you did back in the book of Judges. That's in effect what he's saying here. And uh, so, so this is impressive for a lot of reasons. The Midianites, of course, they're the tribes from the fourth son of uh, Abram by Keturah and so on. And this is all, he's alluding to history here, so we don't have to hammer it that hard. But in the book of Judges, we can read how God judged those nations back there. In Judges 4 and 5, we have those histories, and that's what's in, making an allusion here. I won't take the time to go through all that here. And so, of course, Endor is a well-known spot for a variety of reasons, but we'll just move on here for this purpose. And make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and Zalmunna. And I don't have to track down each one of these for this purpose. The Oreb and Zeb were the prince generals of Midian. Zeba and Zalmunna were the kings. So it's their kings and their military leaders, this summary that God dealt with here. Who said, let make ourselves uh, houses of God in possession. And of course, God uh, really, he, they're defeated by Gideon. And uh, the men of Ephraim intercepted the Midianites, and there was a big slaughter back in Judges 7 and 8. And so these are allusions the psalmist is using to history. Do to our enemies today what you did back then, is what he's saying in effect. O God, make them like a wheel, like stubble before the wind. As the fire burneth the wood, and the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them in thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. This is the plea of the psalmist to God. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O God. I think that's kind of interesting. There's a name for God that they're unifying under. And I suggest that might be Allah. But he goes on here. He says, Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, as the Most High over all the earth, Wow! I think that's rather interesting. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Yehovah, or however you want to pronounce it, art the most high over all the earth. And most of the rabbis won't pronounce the name, they'll just pronounce the letters, yod heh vav heh Or in, the, in the Ye- Yehovah, if you use the German J and so on. Anyway, in contrast to Allah, the moon god, that these people apparently are confederated under. Does this sound like today's news clip? It's astonishing as you look at it, the more you look at this, the more it sounds like it could happen next week. The world is getting ready for it. The, 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 there's a, a huge, huge tension brewing. It's about to boil over in the Middle East. And it could be viewed as fitting Psalm 83. Which, if that's correct, Psalm 83 implies a huge victory for Israel where those enemies are wiped out. And one of my private suspicions is if, if Obama d- wipes out Iraq's nuclear weapon, uh, nuclear capability, Netanyahu could simultaneously take his tank and wipe out the Hezbollah to the north and the Hamas to the south and just reestablish the, orders, the, the borders of Israel and let the world scream and shout and rumble and ignore them. Up yours, world, and get on with it. That's a possibility. And if it happens, 
and that leads to an enormous prosperity for Israel, it could set the stage for Ezekiel 38, where the outer ring nations come in to take spoil and God intervenes and doesn't let them. See, apparently, according to Psalm 83, it would seem this is the only way the world is going to know that God is God, is for Him to move in judgment. That's the flavor of this psalm. Now, getting back to verse 3, who are these treasured ones that it makes allusion to? I don't know. I've gone through every conceivable conjecture and none of them fit. The one possibility, and it's just a conjecture, maybe this psalm is a post-rapture event and the holy treasured ones are the departed saints in God's bosom. Well, that puts us in a very weird position. Because if Psalm 83 is after the rapture, and Psalm 83 is about to happen this week, next month, who knows? Wow, we may not have long between us and the rapture if that conjecture is correct. Boy, that makes the agenda of this weekend zero right in on session six. Because we want to build a chart, not what happens on the earth during this, the 70 weeks and all that. If there's a rapture beforehand, and God brings them with him at the second coming, what's going on in heaven? There are a couple of things we're going to focus on in session six. And they're going to be the most important agenda that you and I are going to carry away from this weekend. Interestingly enough, we have an opportunity to cram for the final. Okay, so let's move. Judgment. When you get to Ezekiel, there are seven nations listed that Jesus is going to wipe out when he comes back. Did you know that? He's coming back as a warrior. Remember in Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, he, he reads his mandate at the, at the synagogue in Nazareth, but he stops at a comma, closes the book and says, this day is this fulfilled. The part he doesn't read is deferred and the day of vengeance of our God. And we'll be looking at that here shortly. But we have Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon. These seven are clobbered by the Lord when he comes back. And each of the judgments are detailed in Ezekiel there. They are all Muslims. Very interesting. They're all Muslims. So there is a war going on. Now the enemies, at the present time, they're surrounded, uh, Israel is surrounded by their immediate neighbors that are committed to wiping them off the map. And it's misleading to represent them as Arabs. No, they're Muslims. The Persians resent being called Arabs, but they're Muslims. It would appear that a prerequisite victory for Israel will set the stage for a subsequent uh, ill-fated event of Ezekiel 38 and 39, seeking spoils, gold and silver, cattle and goods, and so forth. The order of Israel is regathered in land, ancient cities are rebuilt and inhabited, they meet the uh, Muslim resistance, they establish an army for defense. Adjacent Muslim nations confederate, as we saw here. And the confederacy is committed to the destruction of Israel, as we've seen here. War starts between the confederacy and Israel. Title is regained. My people Israel is reestablished after Hosea chapter 1 and all that. Israel decisively defeats the confederacy, and that scripture is full of those ref references. Israel has become an exceedingly great army after Ezekiel 37. Israel takes prisoners of war, fascinating enough, in Jeremiah and Zephaniah. And uh, the region is reshaped. And that's where Isaiah 17, 1 may be part of the picture. Who knows? Israel expands its borders, as that's alluded to by Obadiah, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. And then, of course, Israel dwells securely in the land, which is a precondition for Ezekiel 38. And the segment of God's plan is to be fulfilled. And then, maybe, the ill-fated Magog invasion attempt will be ready. And uh, so that's, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, projection. But in any case, that having all been said, now let's focus on what our real topic is, and that's the 70th week. We've had the precedent conditions prior to the 70th week in front of us. And uh, so we're going to have, it's defined by a covenant being enforced by a coming world leader. And the last half, it splits the week, this event it splits the week into two halves, and the Lord himself labels the second half the Great Tribulation. And uh, so, each half is the most documented period of time in the entire Bible. It's called the middle of the week, half of, three, half of seven is three and a half years. 
It's labeled as 42 months, each half. It's labeled 1260 days, each half. The Holy Spirit's done everything but put it in nanoseconds for you. In other words, it is cross-checked so many different ways that you can't allegorize it. It's half of a seven-year period. It's 42 months long in the front, 42 mu months in the second half, and uh, 30, uh, you know, uh, 1260 days in each part, and so forth. In w some of the uh, labels to this are a little cryptic. One, it said time, times, and half a time. The splitting of time, uh, the dividing of time. The word times I is um, a dual, not a plural. That's strange. See, in our, in our, in English, you have a single, singular, and a plural. Plural is more than one. That's unique to English. Hebrew and Aramaic had a single, a dual, and a plural. And that, to me, that's very interesting. You want to understand this. In Genesis, Barashit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word for God there is Elohim. Now, you may not realize it. You know enough Hebrew already to know that that's a, mas that's a masculine plural noun. Elohim is plural. Cherubim is plural for cherub. Seraphim is plural for seraph. See, the I-M ending is a plural for a masculine noun. So you know Elohim is plural, but it's always used as if it was a singular. When Elohim appears in Hebrew grammar, it's wrong. It's a plural used as a singular noun. Well, we smile at that because Elohim is God, right? There's a little fact about Hebrew grammar that when I realized it blew me away. In Hebrew, a plural is three, not two. Elohim is three, a trinity, by grammar. In the first verse, and in the, in the Shema, Echad means unified, is one in the sense of becoming a plurality, becoming unity. So anyway, but anyway, times is a, in the Hebrew and in Aramaic, a dual. The only place we have a dual in English, if I told you that all my friends came over last night, both of them, you laugh because I'm saying there's only two of them, see, that both is a dual. It's the only place in English I'm aware of it. We have singular plurals, if you will. Well, in, in uh, both Hebrew and Aramaic, you have times a dual. So if you have time, times, and the dividing time, it's a way of saying three and a half. That's not obvious when it's translated into the English, but it's obvious in the Hebrew or the Aramaic. And it's, uh, it's that way in Daniel 7 and Daniel 12 and Revelation 12. And so, so it's three and a half years in Daniel 9 and 12. And it's 42 months in Revelation 11 and 13. It's 1260 days in Revelation 11, 3 and in Daniel 12, 6. In other words, in both the Old and New Testament, these terms are used consistently. Okay? It's half a week in Daniel 9, 27. And so on. Okay, the great tribulation is defined there in Matthew 24, verse 20. For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So this is that period that Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to climax in the day of the Lord. And uh, so again, uh, and Revelation 6 through from chapter 6 through 19 is a detailing of this period of time that's called the 70th week of Daniel 9. Jeremiah, uh, in, in Daniel 12, it reads, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that it shall be found in the written of the book. Not all of them, but the ones that are in the book of life, obviously. But it's that phrase where Jesus seems to quote it. Uh, and, uh, but then also I think it's very relevant to uh, Hosea 5.15. I will go and return to my place to, until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. So this leads us to the topic itself of the Great Tribulation, and the question that lurks behind our thoughts is, does the church go through it? That's a big debate among many. And there are alternative views. We've reviewed them in the past. The post, the mid, and the pre-wrath are all deny eminence. We lean to a pre-trib position, but you should be on your own alert and come to your own conclusions on that. And But notice that the pre-trib position implies a interval between that rapture and the beginning of the 70th week. And with that, a lot of other mysteries get um, the fog lifts. And we talked about the doctrine of eminency, the next expectation. We've covered this already. This is a review, if you will. And so, 
Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. We've been through this. This is by way of review. And uh, it also is constructive from a personal walk point of view. And so uh, Paul seemed to include himself, of course, among those that looked for his return. And Timothy was admonished the same way. And uh, the Jewish converts in the, in the Epistle of Hebrews, uh, same thing. So this is a really a review of what we've talked about before. So there are two extremes that we've talked about, the rapturitis and rapture, you know, that, that is the paralysis for the, from over, over dwelling on it, and rapture mania where you try to set, set dates. And the 70th week is defined by the covenant enforced by coming world leader, not the rapture. The great tribulation is the only the last half. It's three and a half years, not seven years. And the leader cannot be revealed until after the rapture, so that tends to put everything else in focus. And we took this out of Daniel chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the apostasy, will, they will come except there be a falling away in apostasy first. Then shall the restrainer be removed in the sense that he's the, he is the uh, sealer, if you will, of the, of the church. And so he'll, that'll be removed. He'll be taken out of the way. He comes back to, there'll be more people. Most scholars believe there'll be more people saved after the rapture than before. The Holy Spirit's very active, but not in the sense of sealing and, and dwelling and so forth. That's unique to the church. But in any, any case, after he's removed, then shall the wicked one be revealed. The key idea here is the man of sin is revealed after the, uh, after the rapture. It's a prerequisite condition. That's why Satan has to, what, Satan's got a plan. He's got a, it can't discharge it until after the rapture. So he, but he doesn't know where the rapture is, so he has to be ready all along. And so, and so we've had this diagram before, as I've indicated. From your hermeneutics, I can predict your eschatology. Okay. Well, let's get at the prince that shall come. That's one of 33 titles of this coming world leader. He's the seed of the serpent. In Genesis 3.15, there are two seeds mentioned. The seed of the woman is a title of the Messiah, where the woman is Israel. And there's also a seed of the serpent. Both are mentioned there. And that's one of his 33 titles in the Old Testament. And uh, Daniel 9.27, it says, And he, that is the prince that shall come, shall enforce the covenant with the many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make a desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, the covenant is enforced with the many. That's an idiom for Israel. He, the, he is the, the precedent, the pronoun, first the last mentioned noun, which was the prince that shall come. He shall enforce the covenant. doesn't sign a treaty, he enforces a covenant. He might sign a treaty, or he might simply enforce the covenant of, of Israel to, 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 to the land. It could be that simple. And in the midst of the week, see, he apparently makes the covenant for a week. He apparently grants them permission for whatever. And that's why most scholars assume that that includes, among other things, the rebuilding of their temple. He lets them do that. But in the middle of the week, he breaks his word. In the, middle of the, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's why we think it's not limited to, but it includes the temple somehow in the, in the uh, covenant. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation. They've actually restarted the animal sacrifices in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. We don't know when it's going to be built. We know it'll be in place by the middle of the week because Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it. Jesus makes reference to it in Matthew 24, 15. And <coughs> Paul makes reference to it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And John makes reference to it, uh, among other places, in Revelation chapter 11. First two verses. He shall cause the sacrifice and the blessing to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. The abomination of desolation, that requires some definitions here. The word abomination in the Bible, by, used by God, refers to idol worship. Anything other than the, worshiping anything other than God himself is an abomination. The abomination that makes us desolate is to not only worship an idol, but to put that idol in the most insulting place possible, which is in Jerusalem, in the temple, in fact, in the Holy of Holies. And the reason we, so mon we know so much about it is it happened in, pa in the past. It happened in 167 B.C. by a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. He'll come up in some charts here anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. It's in your charts. But the point is that that is the 
Jesus makes reference to a historical event that is yet future. In other words, it happened once before. What's going to happen again will be just like that. You get the picture. So that's, the, that's why we're so comfortable in our definition of the abomination of desolation, because it happened once before. And we know a lot about that in detail, and it's very parallel. And Todd's Epiphany made, made a deal with Jerusalem, and in the middle of his country, he violated it and set himself up to be worshipped. And he put a Greek idol in the Holy of Holies. And that precipitated the Maccabean Revolt, which they succeeded in throwing off the yoke of the Greek Empire. It leads to a period of time called the Hasmoneans, a period of time where they were free to do that and so on. So it's part of history, a lot about it. So, the abomination of desolation. If we are nominally at about the time of Christ, so sometimes say about 32 AD roughly, in the middle of the, in, in the part of the Roman Empire. Prior to that was the Greek Empire, and prior to that was the Persian Empire. It was in the Greek Empire in 167 BC that the Antiochus Epiphanes did exactly that, put an, a, an a, 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 a idol to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. Among other things, he made the, having the Torah uh, against the law, he slaughtered a, a pig on the sacred altar. Everything he could, ima- he deliberately did everything he could is to inflame the Jewish community and they rebelled. And Judeus Maccabeus uh, and his, he had five sons and they, uh, one's co- one was called the Hammer, uh, a Maccabean, and uh, so that became the label for the revolt and they l- succeeded in throwing off the, the Greek Empire. And it took him three years to do that and cleanse the temple from all the desecration. And they celebrate that to this day. It's called Hanukkah. Set aside the colorful legends about the holiday. The primary thing is they're celebrating the rededication of the temple after, six, uh, after cleansing it from the ravages of Antiochus Epiphanes. And so, so he's an interesting character. He's the eighth king of the Syrian dynasty the infamous brother of Cleopatra. The word Epiphanes means illustrious. The children on the street called him Epimenes, which means the madman. And uh, so Matthias uh, uh, had the five sons, and one of them was Judas Maccabeus, an amazing military genius, and he established the rule of the Hasmonean priest rulers for the next century. That was until the Romans conquered it and became part of the Roman Empire. But they had quite a distinguished er era there. Antiochus Epiphanes made the Torah reading punishable by death, slaughtered a sow on the altar, erected an idol to Zeus in the Holy of Holies, which is called the abomination of desolation in the past and is also yet going to happen again in the future. And that led to the Maccabean Revolt. In three years they threw off the Seleucid Empire and rededicated the temple, which is celebrated as Hanukkah. Did you know that Hanukkah is alluded to in the New Testament? Most people don't realize it. In John 10.22 there's an allusion to Hanukkah. Why is it in there? Because the Holy Spirit wants you to under, even though it's not one of the feasts of Moses, it is a feast that has huge implication for the Christian to understand what Hanukkah is really all about. The rededication of the temple. And um, that's a little stu- side study of its own, but you can dig it out pretty quickly, easily on your own. And uh, it's kind of interesting to discover that there are several times in history where a leader tried to do the same thing and was interrupted. Um, it was um, Claudius, I think. Anyway, one of the um, Roman emperors ordered his general, Petronius, to put an image of him in the Holy of Holies. And Petronius wouldn't do it because he knew that would lead again to a Maccabean kind of revolt, so he didn't do it. And uh, the emperor dies, and by a mix-up of messages, the message of his death got to Judea before the command to put the idol in the Holy of Holies, so it became null and void because the emperor had died. So he didn't do it. Caligula was, Caligula was the, the guy that uh, was at fault here. But it fascinates me that attempts to do that were intervened by God. Why? Because there's an event that's going to be a milestone for all of us, yet future, when that happens. The emerging world leader... There are 33 different titles for him in the Old Testament. Among the more well-known ones, the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3, he's the idle shepherd of Zechariah 11. That's the only physical description of the Antichrist in the Bible, and it is there. Um, he's the little horn of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. He's represent- a horn is an is a ancient symbol of authority. Um, he's the prince that shall come, as I've mentioned before. He's called the willful king in Daniel 11. 
And these are all in your notes, of course. And in the New Testament, there's 13 titles there. Uh, he's the beast of Revelation 11 and 13. He's called the false prophet in Revelation 13, the second of the two guys. The word Antichrist is a strange label, by the way. We call, that's the one that sticks. That's the one we say, Antichrist, we all think we know what we're talking about. It's a little weird because that word is only used by John, and it's not used of him. John uses the term in his letters to represent a spirit, a, a spirit of Antichrist. It's not, he's not really talking about an individual per se. The word Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ, technically. It means in, in the place of Christ. A pseudo-Christ is more precise. Antichristos in the Greek isn't what it sounds like to us. Obviously, he's against Christ, but the word really means he's in the place of Christ. That's why there's all this talk about the Pope and all that sort of stuff. But in any case, what's interesting is John, who's the only guy that uses that term in a different context, in the entire book of Revelation doesn't use the term Antichrist. He uses several other terms, by the way. But nevertheless, that's the label that has stuck, if you will, in modern usage. So I won't fight that. Just be aware of the fact that it's a strange inversion here. He's called the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians 2. He's called the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. Jesus calls him the one who comes in his own name. I come in my Father's name, you receive me not. Another comes in his own name, and him you will receive. That's why many of the experts believe he'll be Jewish. We don't know that. We know he's accepted by Israel for some weird reason, but whatever. Okay, so that's... Uh, and he's called the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2. And uh, is he a Jew or Gentile? There are good scholars that take both sides. Some say he'll be, the leader will be the son of Satan. That's clearly from the scripture. Some believe the leader will be a Jew, and there's a whole bunch of arguments for that. And uh, uh, also, there's a, some believe he'll be a Gentile, and there's a whole bunch of arguments for that. So you can take your pick. But let's, when we get into those arguments, remember there's two guys. We're not talking about a single guy. There's a single political leader, but he has a religious priest promoting his worship, called the false prophet, as a second title of him, if you will. And so, coming world leader. The term that I would use, if I was writing in this area, is I'd call him Mr. Big Mouth. Because it's interesting, in Daniel 7, and in Daniel 11, in Psalm 52, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he is always shooting off his mouth. He's making arrogant claims. That's one of his characteristics. So if you want a title for him, I'd call him Mr. Big Mouth. Six times in the scripture he's called that. He will be a son of Satan in some sense. And... Uh, He'll be an intellectual genius, obviously a brilliant guy. The guy that's coming is going to be fantastic. He is going to be the most attractive guy the world has ever seen. We'll know better by the Holy Spirit, but the world won't see that. They're going to see a guy with the answers, with a plan to help the world out of its mess. He'll be an oratorical genius. I don't think he needs teleprompters. Okay. He will be a political genius. He'll be a commercial genius. He will be a military genius. He, does, he comes to power by peacemaking, not by military. But he becomes so powerful that he will be militarily very, very able. He'll be a governmental genius. He'll be a religious genius. He's, he's all of these things. The scripture supports every one of these. And there's a bunch of other passages in your notes you can take a look at if you're trying to get up to speed on, on who this guy is. And so... Isaiah 10 gives us some identities here. Thus, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. That's interesting. He shall smite thee with a rod, and he shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. And yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. This is Isaiah talking in Isaiah 10. Look at Isaiah 15. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. This world leader was originally Nimrod, who was an Assyrian. The first world leader was, a Nimrod, was Nimrod, the Assyrian. The last world leader on the planet earth will be an Assyrian. It's interesting, the symmetry I think is very provocative. And uh, then will I break the Assyrian... Uh, in my land, and so forth. 
The Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and he shall show the lightning down from his, of his arm with the indignation of his anger and with the flame of a devouring fire and with scattering the tempest and the hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with See, I want you to see, not to get into the details, but you see the term Assyrians all through Micah and all through Isaiah as is an identity here. And uh, Micah 5, And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. And he shall tread in our palaces, and we rise against him with seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, when he treadeth within our borders. And again, we have the Assyrian, the Nimrod even again, and the Assyrian. So there's more homework to be done. Is he Muslim? Very likely. But that's not his defining characteristic. He's... And the people, the prince that, prince that shall... The reason, there's a, a whole mis, misunderstanding. In Daniel 9, verse 26, it says, The pr- people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. They were the Roman legions. But Roman legions were not necessarily European. The legions of Rome were conscripts. The tenth legion, which is the one that brought the temple down, were cohorts and auxiliaries from a number of uh, uh, cohorts that are all Assyrians. So the people of the prince that shall come were the ones that destroyed this. That's, that, that linkage is what's caused many writers to presume that somehow it's a, Euro, it's a Western Europe player in the, the, uh, the end times. But let's shift and talk about the mark of the beast. People who know nothing about the Antichrist all know about the 666. That's a very pop. There are books written that totally miss the point. Let's go at this. Revelation 13, and he causes both, uh, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. These people take a sign of allegiance to the leader, and for some reason they have it in their right hand and on their foreheads. And there's a couple of possibilities about that, but to understand the the number isn't the person's number, it's his number. They're taking his identity as a sign of allegiance. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. And around that, books have been written that talk about barcodes and in certain inserting things and all that sort of stuff. It turns out the 603 score and 6 is an inference from the Greek letters. There are three Greek letters there in the original text, uh, and these three Greek letters have numerical values of 660 and 6. So those three letters can be construed geometrically as a number 666. If that is correct, it's the only place in the Bible that the text leans on geometria. The numerical value of the letters. The fact that the letters have numerical value is very interesting from a number of points of view, but it's not used by the Holy Spirit to communicate directly, unless this is one of them. Now, these three uh, letters have names. The first and last is the, f- is the first and last letters of the word Christos. But you put this little serpent thing between the two, and you get a symbol that seems appropriate for the Antichrist. So that's that is played upon by some writers, and that's okay, no problem. The Antichrist, or Pseudo-Christ, if you will, is symbolized by those three letters. And those three letters ha- apparently have the number 666. So that's the subject of a lot of uh, uh, conjectures. But whose number are we talking about? We're not talking about our number, we're talking about his number. Insertable chips, RFID, barcodes, that has to do with my number. If I have a credit card or something, that's not the issue, it's his number that I want an identity with. They're different. See, they missed the point. And uh, it's his number and name that are critical identity issues. Now, in al- Greek alphanumerics, okay, those three letters have the value 666, as I've just shown you. And uh, so it is wh- wh- whatever it's worth. People say, well, that's gematria. No, wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. When you say gematria, what gematria are you talking about? There's the normal ri- uh, form of gematria. There are ones where you take the, number, uh, the values plus the number of letters. 
Another one, you take small values, 10. And there are all kinds of games you can play with Gemetria. And um, this is one of those places where I suggest to you, you remember that if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. You can fool around with these numbers to prove anything you like. So I wouldn't try to prove anything with Gemetria. There are aspects of that that are worth studying. It's kind of fascinating, but don't, you don't put doctrine on it. That's naive. There is a passage in Zechariah 11, which is the only physical description of the Antichrist I'm aware of in the Bible. Woe to the idle shepherd. That's not, not lazy. That's the false worship kind of idol. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. A sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. This leads to a conjecture that the Antichrist, who apparently suffers from a head wound, is thought to be dead and comes back to life, but he may ha apparently has an impaired arm, his right arm, apparently. Um, his sword shall be upon his arm, we don't know if it's right or left, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. He's blind in one eye. And it's not Moshe Dayan, that was the wrong eye, he was a left eye. But anyway, the point is, um, um, maybe the identity of his followers reflects that by having something on their forehead and in the right arm to claim an identity. That's a possibility. There's even a more provocative possibility we'll come to in a minute. But that's one possibility I wanted you aware of, to be aware of. The 666. While Ed Shabbat was watching a movie called uh, The... Um, Kingdom of Heaven is a movie about the Crusader period, but they redid really the research and all the tribes that are fighting there in the movie, it reminded Walid of something he knew as a kid growing up. That in Islam, if you're at war, it's traditional to have a headband with Allah on it and on the right arm. And they did that in the movie, that reminded Walid something he had forgotten. The Shadda Duran, it's a, it's a declaration of allegiance to Allah and Muhammad that's worn by millions on their forehead or their right arm. And when he saw that in the movie, it reminded him of that, and he remembered the passage in Revelation 13. And uh, the Greek, uh, it's the right arm of the right side that's at issue here, and it's a badge of servitude and, and uh, so forth. So now, he went back and took a closer look at Revelation 13 and 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for the, it is a number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. And here's wisdom. Well, that's pretty straightforward. We know it wisdom, broad and full of intelligence, and all that sort of stuff. That's good. Uh, the word count is actually the word reckon, or decide by voting. Really? Not counting like numerically, it's attributing. And... Uh, it is the, the word number is arithmos in the Greek, and that word in Greek can mean one of two things. It can mean an indefinite multitude, a number of people came over, some number, some group. You see, it's, it's, it's used as an indefinite multitude, or it also is used for a precise number, like 13 or 17, you see. So it says a, it is the number of a beast. Now, it can be in, now the word number here occurs three times. And that word in the Greek can mean an indefinite thing or a very precise thing, your choice, from context. Okay. So man is pretty straightforward, as anthropos, being a human, a man. And his number is 603 score and six, but it turns out that's not in the text. There are three letters in the text. And here's where it gets pretty interesting. Let's take a look at this. If we look at the papyri and look at it more closely, and you look at this, you'll discover there are three letters there that people presume are Greek. If it's Greek, it goes from left to right, and you've got those three letters. Um, and uh, so this is a, this is a, um, uh, a you know, fragmentary, a late third, fourth century papyri. And uh, so you have those three letters there. But it's a presumption that they're in Greek. In the book of Revelation, it says John wrote down what he saw. All through that, he wrote down what he heard or wrote down what he saw. Here he wrote down what he saw. What did he see? He saw those three things. Okay. He's doing this, by the way, six centuries before Muhammad. Okay, let's keep this in mind. If we take a closer look 
at those things from Codex Vaticanus, 350 AD, it turns out upon examining these things more closely, there's some subtleties here that suggest maybe it's not Greek in the first place. John wrote what he saw. Now, if it's Arabic, it flows from the right to the left, not from the left to the right. And this is, of course, many centuries before Muhammad. And it turns out that if you know Arabic, that those first two letters say, in the name of Allah. And uh, it's written as a slightly upward angle. The two swords that follow it are the traditional symbol of Islam. Those, that's not an X, it's two swords, is in the view as a conjecture. We're not sure, but it's a possibility. But it has some very, very interesting implications if that is Arabic. Because if you look at Arabic, that word can lay on its side, it can be at angles, it's on an angle on the flag, every rock itself, by the way. So that's kind of fun. So uh, that's the word Allah. So this is an alternative translation of Revelation 13, 18 that Walid suggests is a possibility. He's not selling it. He's just highlighting from his scholastic background in Arabic and Islam to recognize this translation is legitimate. I'm going to show you. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding decide who the multitude of the beast is. For it is the multitude of a man. In other words, Muhammad. And his multitude are in the name of Allah. Wow. It's possible he's right. We don't know. But it's a, it is a whole other complexion, especially for there's lots of other reasons that people are increasingly becoming to the realization that Islam is emerging as the primary warfare against the God of the Bible. You've got to beware of all the deceit that's prevalent in the press and in our culture. Allah is not the Arabic name for God. That's a lie they promote. Allah is a specific God. When you translate the Quran into French or German or whatever, you, that's a word you don't translate. It's the name of the God they worship. And it happens to be the moon God, as exemplified by a lot of reasons in the history and the rest of it. No, it is not a, a religion of peace. The Quran is a warrior code. There are hundreds of commands to kill Jews and Christians throughout the Quran. It is a, it is a, it, the goal of Islam is to force itself on the entire world, by force if necessary. In Islam, it's encouraged to lie, if it's in the interest of Islam. The, 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 uh, the, uh, they celebrate an event by Muhammad. He made a treaty with a, his own tribe, the Quraysh tribe, of peace. But as soon as he was strong enough, he wiped them out. And that's not just a point of history, it's something they celebrate in Islam as a victory. And when Yasser Arafat would make speeches, and the English had never matched them, the Her Arabic, um, if you had people that knew Arabic and saw the speech, the English release was nothing, but bore no resemblance. And, and he would tell his followers, don't worry about my peaceful things. I, that's a, there's a na name in, uh, in uh, Quran for that deceit that, they, that Muhammad uses. And uh, Yasser Arafat used to brag that he was doing the same thing Muhammad did, is to lie in the interests of Islam until we're strong enough to swat them. See? And so uh, the point is, most of what you've heard about Islam hides the real truth. So one of the uh, uh, things you, you're faced with is doing some homework to really understand the sinister nature of Islam and its power. And uh, so... So obviously, uh, uh, Walid Shabbat uh, argues that the Antichrist will, may prove to be a Muslim, and Joel Richardson and some other very good scholars and good articulate writers are really picking up that, uh, that theme. It's, uh, it's very, very clear that the adversary to Christian, to not just Jews, but Christians, they teach the kids a little, uh, what we call a nursery rhyme. Today, Friday, then Saturday, then Sunday. What they mean, today, Friday is their holy day. Saturday is the Jewish holiday, and Sunday the Christian's holiday. They take them in that order. But their goal is the, is the subjugation of the entire world under Sharia law. And so uh, it is what it is.